The 7th of September 1927 was an imperative day in human history. It was a turning point in the world of technological inventions. On this day, the world's first black and white electronic television was powered in the city of San Francisco in the United States. As humans, we have come a very long way since then. After watching television in black and white, we eventually moved on to color television and then after that we made the switch to digital television. And now we are at the point where we are using smart television. In this modern digital and virtual world, even smart TVs and radios have been replaced by our smartphones. If we look back through history, we will see that in 1998, Yahoo turned down an offer to buy Google for only $1 million. By the year 2000, Yahoo was worth more than $125 billion. And no one on this earth could have imagined that it would lose to the same company that it had turned down the chance to buy for only $1 million. In the case of Kodak, there was a time when people associated the brand name Kodak with real cameras. However, in today's modern era, neither the real camera nor the brand name Kodak exist anymore. In a relatively short amount of time, Netflix, which has been at the top of its game and the dominant leader in the OTT industry, has seen a sharp drop in the subscription and customers. They lost a million subscribers in the last three months. So will Netflix follow in the same footsteps of companies like Yahoo and Kodak or will it be a phoenix rising from the ashes? Also, where did Netflix go wrong and why are customers unsubscribing from Netflix subscription? today? Netflix is dwindling at a very alarming rate. On one hand, Netflix can't get new subscribers and on the other, some of its current users are also leaving. Ironically, Netflix, the company that pioneered and gave birth to over the top, that is OTT platform, is being deserted by its own customers. Now, the curious question is why is this exactly happening? Also, is Netflix responsible for all of this and is there any fault where Netflix should be blamed? And finally, what are the most important lessons that we can learn from this business case story and apply to our own business? Now, before I answer your questions about this intriguing and interesting business case story, I would like to ask you to quickly subscribe to Alpha Use to get similar brand and business stories, case studies, insights and resources, especially if you are an entrepreneur a solopreneur, a content creator, a small or medium business owner, a student or anybody who is hustling or dreaming, you are in the right place because we cover free and new business content specifically for you. So hit the bell icon so that whenever a brand new story is out, you get notified instantly. After you have subscribed, please comment below. I subscribed and I would personally comment on all those comments. In addition, all of our business services, products, case studies, stories and resources are available at alphause.com. Please visit the same page and sign up for our newsletter there too. Now let's get back to our story. So this story begins during the era when the internet was on the rise. On the 29th of August 1997, Mark Randolph and Reed Hastings started Netflix in the town of Scotts Valley, California in the United States. Reed Hastings was a mathematician and a computer scientist who helped found the company Pure Atria which was purchased for $750 million by Rational Software Corporation in 1997. He got $2.5 million out of this deal, which he later invested in Netflix. At that time, this was the largest acquisition in the history of Silicon Valley. Mark Randolph had worked as a marketing director for Pure Artria. At one point in his career, he served as a Boldland International's Vice President of Marketing. And before that, he helped found a computer mail order company, Micro Warehouse. Many speculations have been made about the origins of Netflix's original concept and idea. But nobody seems able to settle on a single version. Reed Hastings has mentioned in a few of his previous appearances that he once rented the movie Apollo 13 from Blockbuster and paid a $40 fine because he returned it six weeks late. This made him wonder if there was a better way to rent movies than through Blockbuster that wouldn't charge him late fees. This thought led to the creation of Netflix. Mark Randolph, the other co-founder of Netflix, has claimed that all of these stories are nothing more than a marketing gimmick. According to him, the inspirational idea of Netflix came to him when he was driving back from office. This can also be true as he was a previous co-founder of a business known as Micro Warehouse. Now, Mark was able to demonstrate a strong understanding of marketing and online order service, which contributed to the promotion to the position of CEO of Netflix during the company's early days. Another rumor 
is Mark and Reed came up with this idea while carpooling between their homes. Nevertheless, the world believes in Reed Hastings' stories as Mark and Dolph left Netflix in the year 2003. Now, can I be completely honest with you? Well, if you look closely, you will realize that there are a lot of fake stories which is communicated to the general public so that the brands are able to connect with their target audience. The goal is to make our relationship with these businesses stronger and more stable. We have all heard as well as I have personally covered the story of Google, Amazon, Disney, Apple and many more which started in a garage, which they certainly did and also a true fact. Yet. When motivational speakers and multi-level marketing professionals use it in a way to leverage the emotions of their audience that the founders were very poor and that was the reason is completely a false narrative. They may have had a humble beginning but none of them were living in absolute poverty. If you take a look at life as a whole, you will notice that everything starts out humble but over time it starts to take shape and grows larger. The honest truth is that even this is a marketing strategy known as a pseudo-inspiring story. For instance, many people around the world portray the story with a wrong narrative of how a person was charged a fine of $40 and he took revenge by creating a company worth billions and wiping out the competition. Here's the catch. With this narrative, the common people are expected to do the same and become entrepreneurs of that scale. No one tells you that Reed Hastings was a computer scientist and a strong mathematician and he also had experience founding a million dollar company with a financial backing of $2.5 million where he founded Netflix, which is without a doubt a very good amount of money when you consider the time which was 1997. Now, when it comes to personal branding also, you will see the same thing. For instance, let's take Elon Musk. We all know that Tesla and all the other companies where Mr. Musk is associated, the prices are inflated because of Elon Musk being associated with the brand. Now, we might all have heard the narrative, Elon Musk works seven days a week and to save time, he only sleeps in the office. Well, it could have happened at a certain time in the past, but the story is not true at all. Elon Musk has quite a lavish life with a number of affairs already in his life. So once you hear the false narrative, you are again expected to be Elon Musk and work hard for seven days a week and then you are put in a guilt trip, which is not okay. Here's the truth. Everyone is made different and has different physical and mental abilities, different ways of thinking and understanding and lives in different situations and countries. We are all living our own story. So please do yourself a favor and whenever you hear these glamorous and inspirational stories that companies and brands sell you, they might not be true in the first place. So do a reality check before grinding and putting yourself in a guilt trap. Also, Stay away from people who try to sell you motivation. I don't think motivation is the only way to be successful. Motivation is all about intensity, but success comes from being consistent, which is what discipline means. Anyways, let's get back to our story of Netflix. So on August 29, 1997, Reed Hastings and Mark Rudolph started Netflix with 30 employees and 925 DVDs. In fact, Netflix was the pioneer and world's first DVD rental website. As soon as the website went live, orders started coming in and within 15 minutes, the website crashed. By the end of the first day, 137 orders had been placed with Netflix. In the summer of 1998, just a few months after the official launch of Netflix, Jeff Bezos from Amazon wanted to meet the company's founders. At that time, even Amazon was a new company in the block. Amazon then was only four years old and a year earlier in 1997, it raised $54 million when it debuted in the stock market. Bezos was ready to make aggressive purchases in order to expand the company's footprint and make it the everything store as he was feeling the pressure from the investor to do so. As soon as Mark and Reed met Jeff Bezos, it was evident that Amazon wanted to buy and the money on the table was between $14 million to $16 million, yet the Netflix founders declined. While heading back, they reflected on the fact that despite having declined Amazon, they were very well aware of the fact that one day, Amazon would be out competing with them. Well, in the year 1999, the numbers rose to 239,000 subscribers. The number of videos available on Netflix was increased to 3,100. This was the year when Reed takes over as CEO and when Mark is demoted to president following a disastrous meeting with Sony, which also coincides with a slowdown in the company's overall growth. In 2000, Reed Hastings talks to John Antico, who used to run Blockbuster, and asked him to buy Netflix for $50 million. During the meeting, John says no and makes fun of Reed and the rest of the Netflix team. 
Netflix reached 1 million customers in 2001 and continued to expand. In May of 2002, Netflix went public and was valued at $309 million after its IPO raised $82 million. Reed owned 500,000 shares while Mark had 166,000. Netflix opened regional warehouses with overnight delivery after subscribers said that it took too long for them to get their DVDs. Let's get a new movie right away. With Netflix, you mail them back and wait. But only Blockbuster gives you the option of bringing them back to the store and exchanging them. No. In 2003, Mark Randolph quits Netflix and sells his stock. In 2006, Netflix became profitable, producing over $80 million in revenue, and subscribers increased to 6,300,000. Dollars. You might be wondering, wasn't there any competition which Netflix faced through this time period, and why did it grow at such an unprecedented rate? So, before the year 2000, Netflix business model specifically worked on DVD rental services, where a customer gets a DVD, watches it, and returns it via mail. Nonetheless, since its inception in 1997, Netflix was faced with competition from the then market leader Blockbuster. At that time, Blockbuster dominated the market with nearly $4 billion in annual revenue and over 6,000 locations worldwide. However, there was a major flaw in Blockbuster's business model with late fees accounting to more than 15% of their revenue. And this was a major reason why many customers were dissatisfied with how Blockbuster operated. There was a constant fear among customers of Blockbuster that they would be fined for the late fees in case they delayed returning their specific DVDs. When the DVD rental service model was shifted to a subscription business model in the year 1999, Netflix capitalized on this big pain point of the customer and made it a unique selling proposition that is the USP for their company. Netflix offered unlimited DVD rental services to its customers for a small fee of $10 per month and that too without any penalty or late fees. In fact, considering the competition, Netflix specifically had a tagline which said no late fees. After Mark Rudolph left Netflix management team in 2003, Blockbuster realized the opportunity which they have missed and to compensate the same, they also started an online DVD rental service similar to Netflix and directly competing within the same market with the same customers. There were a stacking 9,094 Blockbuster stores in the at that time worldwide. Having all that momentum behind it, in 2006, Blockbuster launched a program called Total Access Program that allowed customers renting DVDs online to swap them out for a new one at no additional cost. Technically, it was what exactly Netflix was doing in the past. The goal was to gain more subscribers and become dominant in this rental business model too. This was a huge, huge success for Blockbuster and while Blockbuster was gaining subscribers and customers at an unprecedented rate, Netflix was losing its customer at the same rate. Netflix lost around 55,000 subscribers in the first quarter of 2007 and stood at the brink. They needed something very innovative to turn around this loss. Well, 2007 was the year when everything was going to change. This was the year Netflix started its streaming services for the general public and it exploded. No one in the world had an idea about streaming services and this was the master stroke that Netflix needed more than ever. This streaming services changed the fate and destiny of Netflix as a company and Netflix invested millions in their data analytics to build a very robust algorithm which referred and recommended people the content of their choice. The algorithm that knew you better than you knew yourself. In the beginning, the company worked with a number of production houses and the production houses also worked with Netflix to get to the top of Netflix's platform so that the content could be spread as quickly as possible and as cheaply as possible. Finally, in 2013, Netflix set up its own production house. While Netflix was rapidly expanding and dominating the market, let us not forget about their arc rival Blockbuster. The table had turned and Blockbuster had to file bankruptcy in the year 2010 when it had a loan of $1 billion. There was a huge disruption in the industry when the entire supply chain was obsolete by Netflix. Now, the customers did not have to wait anymore for the delivery of rental DVDs and mail. Netflix was like a phoenix that rose from the ashes after a difficult period. Blockbuster, on the other hand, had a lot of fixed costs because it had so many stores and employees all over the world. With no competitor in place, Netflix rose to the pinnacle every day. With the highest quality content and through powerful algorithmic recommendation, it won the best online streaming service platform for more than a decade. 
The investors were having the time of their lives as those who invested in Netflix got a $70,000 return which is laudable. With a revenue of $29.5 billion, last year Netflix is currently one of the best performing stocks. Having said all this, not everything is good for the company as the dynamics are changing at a very constant rate. In the last 6 months, share prices have dwindled by an alarming rate and they are facing steep competition. In today's world, Morgan Stanley specified that Netflix faces two major threats. Firstly, Disruption Network In 2007, Blockbuster had an extremely extensive network for the delivery of content, as well as the exact same network that Disney and HBO both have today. Disney releases its movies in theatres and books the profits before launching its own over-the-top OTT platform. As a result, the company always has cash surplus when compared to Netflix. Today, Disney has its own production house which allows it to make the best content possible. The same applies with HBO as it does it in the television industry, where it books and recovers its profit from the TV network before launching it on its own OTT platform. Now you might be wondering then how come this is a threat to Netflix? Well, Disney has Disney Plus and HBO has HBO Max, through which they enter the OTT business and gives a steep competition to Netflix. There was a time when these companies used to give their exclusive rights to Netflix, but with their own OTT platforms in the place, they have sidelined Netflix and that results in lower quality content for Netflix. So technically, Netflix neither has so much experience in making movies and shows like these big production houses, nor has more cash in hand like these companies. This brings me to the second threat for Netflix, which is none other than Amazon. So as I mentioned before, when Amazon tried and failed to acquire Netflix in 1998, the company's founders predicted and speculated that Amazon would eventually enter the market to compete with Netflix. After almost two decades, Amazon was here to compete with Netflix but with a very different business strategy. The major source of revenue for Netflix is subscription fees. However, Amazon doesn't mind losing money on subscriptions because there is a good chance you will end up using your Prime membership to buy stuff from Amazon anyway. If you happen to own an Alexa device, you can use Amazon Music to listen to your favorite songs. One of the key business loopholes in this model is that irrespective of whether it's Amazon Prime or Netflix, either of these services can be used on multiple devices with just one subscription. And Amazon being so huge isn't even bothered for this. Yet this impacts the bottom line for Netflix as their major source of income is just one which is subscription. Well, let me be very honest to you. The truth is that Amazon Prime is just a grabber, which means that Amazon attracts customers to get their Prime membership because it's a gateway to Amazon's ecosystem. I have covered this in more detail in this video, which I'll link up in the i button at the end of this video and also below in the description. So please do check it out after this video. The crazy part is Amazon doesn't earn through Amazon Prime, yet it lets people to enter their ecosystem and then make money through other ways. So technically, to beat the competition, Netflix has to come up with the highest quality of content, but the big issue is that neither it has a lot of experience when compared to existing players nor does it have enough cash to do so and hence we see the share prices dwindling at a very rapid rate. In fact, the day isn't far away when Netflix might turn into another blockbuster and gets obsolete until and unless they pull up something very extraordinary by disrupting the industry just like in 2007. Coming to the most crucial part of this case study, what are the business lessons which you can learn from this business case study and how it can be applied in your existing business and startup? First and foremost, keep reinventing the unique selling proposition or USP of your company or brand and keep a lookout for potential disruption within the industry. If we take Netflix as an example, their USP or unique selling proposition used to be online DVD renters. However, in 2005, they shifted it to a subscription model and in 2007, they switched to a streaming service. As a result of these three shifts, they still have the highest market share in the OTT industry right now. Yet, in this digital era, times have changed and the competition is steep. So it's time for Netflix to reinvent or get obsolete like Kodak and Blockbuster all, as well as Yahoo. They need to play on their strength which is market share and capitalize on that. Secondly and lastly, you always need to have multiple sources of income, not only in business but also in your personal life. Just stay away from spams and shiny object syndrome 
more on that in the next episode well that's all from my end in today's episode this is anuj from alpha use please like this video to make the youtube algorithm gods happy and do subscribe alpha use for brand as well business stories case studies insight and resources similar like this thank you and see you in the next episode till then peace out